I just really can't be any happier for, for so many reasons. I mean, one of the reasons uh, is because I started about three weeks ago, and I have gotten to work with some of the best people that on earth, really. And I'm so excited about the team that we have here. I mean, just starting with Mickey at the top, um, he is willing to lead us where God wants us to go, and he has the courage, the strength, and the endurance, and um, he, I'm so blessed to have him as a mentor. And so I know that you're blessed to have him as a pastor because um, a lot of times when change happens, it can be hard, can it? Yeah, it can be pretty hard. I'm reminded, though, that God calls us to hard things a lot of times in our lives, that God uh, doesn't always ask us to take the easy road. In fact, a lot of times God calls us to take the really hard road. And whenever uh, God calls us into something new, whenever God calls us to move from point A to point B, often that road is pretty bumpy. And so, and we've experienced that, but I think we are on the end of that. I think we have such a bright future here, and I'm so excited, so humbled, and so grateful to be a part of that. And I'm so as I think of Mickey, I also think of Amanda, and I know that you all were blessed by her last week. I'm so excited to be able to work with her. She brings such a passion, such gifts, and such grace to this, and I know that um, she is just going to do a great job, and I get to work with her every day, and that's an amazing thing. And then there's Lucas, who hasn't been here but just uh, a few weeks now, and I mean, he's already one of my best friends, and so um, I know that you all love him, and uh, he's been such a blessing to me. And then there's just this whole staff people like Nancy Tate, people like Fred Howe and Danny, and just everybody. It's just such a blessing. We have such a team here that's willing and ready to do what God has called us to do, and to be part of something like that is just an amazing blessing. So not only am I really excited to be here because of this team that I'm a part of, but I'm really glad to be here because this is home. I graduated from volunteer down, down the street. Chelsea graduated two years after that. We both Graduated at the same time from ETSU. I was, took the six-year path. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Chelsea's been such a blessing to my life, and I know that uh, she echoes the excitement that we have here. It's interesting that I spent 24 years of my life or so looking forward and uh, looking so, with so much anticipation of leaving here, right? Um, that this is Podunk, East Tennessee, uh, but, <laughs> yeah, Jennifer, <laughs> but it took me leaving, right? It took me leaving, it took me meeting people from literally all around the world, it took me traveling to the ends of the earth to really find out that this is the best place on earth, and there's nowhere else I would rather be, and I'm so excited to be here because my heart is here, and this is my community, and this is the community I want to see changed by God, and, um, and I'm going to give it my all. And so I'm so excited to be here because I do believe that great things are in store for us. But make no doubt about it, since I've been gone, Chelsea and I have been in Kentucky for the past two years or so, things have changed, haven't they? We have, <laughs> the very first time I met Amanda, we went... We were in between meetings, and we had a really quick dinner break, like 45 minutes, and that was it. And so I was like, where do you want to go? And her husband, Justin, who you probably met last week, uh, was like, let's go to Wendy's. And I was like, Wendy's? That's the worst place on earth. <laughs> but then we pull up to this Wendy's, and it's the nicest place I've ever been. <laughs> it's, it's really, <laughs> things have changed. And newsflash, if you don't know it yet, Center Street's only two lanes now. That's uh, thrown <laughs> thrown a lot of people off. And that's life. Things change. As hard as it is sometimes, as tough as it is, and as much as we don't want it sometimes, things do change. And the thing is, is that if we don't realize it, they can change so quickly that we can be left behind. And that happens so often. Because not only has Kingsport changed, but our culture has changed, our country has changed as well, for better and for worse. For the first time in probably human history, we now have five generations of people living at the same time. Five generations. I met a young teenager a couple of weeks ago at the grocery store. Her mother, um, well, I guess she was a, 
about eight or nine years old. Her mother and I went to school together, and she was with her 95-year-old great-great-grandmother. 95-year-old great-great-grandmother, five generations. And that makes things weird sometimes, doesn't it? Because there's this thing called the generation gap. And it really does exist absolutely everywhere. For example, it exists in how we get our news. So my grandfather, for example, he would wake up every morning. This is how he would get his news. He'd wake up. He would go outside. He'd pick up the paper. He would go back inside, and he would sit down and for the next hour or so read the newspaper. That was his generation. Now, the next generation, my father's generation, for example, who's here this morning, uh, the chances are the way that he gets his news, he wakes up, he gets ready, he goes to work. When he gets to work, he gets whatever he has to be done that morning done, and then he goes online and looks online for the news. That's his generation. My generation, again, is completely different. Every morning I wake up, my phone goes off. It wakes me up, my iPhone here. This is, you know, 21st century type deal. And I turn off my alarm, and within two swipes of my thumb, I have an app open, and I'm looking at today's headlines before I ever get out of bed. That's my generation. Things have changed right in front of our eyes, haven't they? It's really amazing. Things like the word roaming. When some of you hear the word roaming, if I were to ask my grandmother, who's also here, I'm going to pick on her some this morning. If I asked her what roaming meant, she would probably tell me of some cowboys out on the range uh, walking around, right? Yeah. If I asked some of you, you would think of really expensive phone calls, right? But if I even asked some of you who are much younger, you would probably not even know what that means. It's such an antiquated word now because roaming charges really don't exist anymore. How about, we're going to do an experiment right here. When I say this one word, and it's going to pop up here in just a second, when I say this one word, I want you to think of the very first thing that comes to your mind, the word spam, <laughs> S-P-A-M, spam. So some of you right now, you just started longing for lunch, right? <laughs> you think of this right here. For the silent generation, that's people between their 70s and 90s right now, this is the number one icon of their generation, spam. Some of you think of spam mail, right? Those emails that you hate. That's another generation. I asked my uh, sister, who's 16, a few weeks ago what spam meant to her, and she just said, what does that word mean? It's even... So many things have changed. Now, how about this sign right here? <laughs> Some of you are like, well, what number comes after that, right? It's a number sign, right? And some of you are like, that's hashtag, right? So, <laughs> so crazy different. These are truly interesting times that we live in truly interesting times, not just for us individually, not just for us as a people of culture, not just for us as a collective people, but also for us as Christians. Times are changing, aren't they? We live in a time where 50 churches across our nation are going to worship together for the very last time this week. They're going to close their doors, 50 churches on average every single week. Studies show that one in six of us go to church on a regular basis. That's here in Sullivan County, one in six of us. I think it's somewhere 21 to 23 percent on a good day. So for every one of you, there's five people in our community, five people in your neighborhoods, five people in your families maybe who don't go to church. In fact, only 15 percent of the millennial generation, that's people born after 1982, my generation, only 15 percent claim faith in Jesus Christ. So if you claim to be a follower of Jesus and you're sitting here and you're younger than 30, you are in the extreme minority. For another portion of you, that's your children's age, maybe your grandchildren's age, 15%. Most experts say that we are one generation away from being a fully secular nation. 
And in fact, you can make the argument that we're already there. And all this change and all of this fear, it causes people to do a lot of different things, doesn't it? So you have some people that are on one extreme. They want to absolutely change everything. That everything's changing around them. We have to change to keep up. That's one extreme. Then you have people on the other extreme that they see the change and it scares them. And so they just hold tightly to absolutely everything. And they don't want anything to change. And then if you're like me, you're somewhere in the middle. And I think that's the majority of us. And when you're in the middle of a type of deal like this, you really just don't know what to do. That it's hard to make decisions. It's hard to move forward sometimes. But hear this. Even though these are tricky times, even though these are sometimes scary times, this is not a new crisis. This is not a new crisis. That's the good news. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to the book of Joshua. Chapter 24, verses 14 through 15. Let me read this for you. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites who, in whose land you are living. But as for me, as for me, as for my household, we will serve the Lord. So to put this in context a little bit, this is at the end of Joshua's life. And Joshua had seen many, many great things throughout his life. If you recall the stories of the conquest, miracle after miracle after miracle happened right in front of Joshua's eyes. If you remember when the Israelites crossed into the promised land, they crossed the Jordan River, and God made the river stop so that they would have a path to cross through. If you remember that God listened to Joshua, and he made the sun not set you remember, God made the walls of Jericho crumble to the ground so the city could be conquered. Miracle after miracle happened for Joshua. Now, Joshua is what I would call a first-generation believer, a first-generation believer. He knew without a shadow of a doubt that God was at work in the world. And so it came very easily for Joshua to worship God. Hear the confidence of Joshua. He just said this, I've seen God work. I've seen God's hand in my life, so you do what you want to do. But as for me, as for my household, we will worship the Lord. That confidence. He knew that he knew that he knew that God was God, that he was real, that he was at work in the world, and that he was making a difference. And so for some of you, you're right there with Joshua. You are a first-generation believer. You just know that you know that you know. You can tell testimony and give testimony after testimony of what God has done in your life. God is so real to you that you experience him daily, that when you see things, you just see them through the lens of the kingdom, and you just know that's God's hand at work. And so for you, there's no choice. It's crystal clear. For you and for your household, you will worship God. And so Joshua and his contemporaries, people like Caleb, people like Rahab, they were these first-generation believers. Now, these first-generation believers had kids, as we do. And those kids were what we would call second-generation believers. They watched what their parents had went through. They heard about what happened to their parents, how God worked in their life. So if you look at Joshua 24, verse 31... Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the works that the Lord did for Israel. The second generation had only known. They hadn't experienced it firsthand like the first generation, but they heard testimony over and over of what their parents had went through. And so they knew God and they came to faith in God and they worshiped God and they gave their lives to God, but something was different something was just a little bit different because they didn't 
have it firsthand. And so what happens is that second generation has kids. And if you look at Judges chapter 2, verse 10, we read about that generation. Finally, that generation, talking about the second generation, died. And the next generation did not worship Jehovah as their God and did not care about the mighty miracles he had done for Israel. And so what happens with this third generation is that they become people who don't really care about the Lord. They're so far separated from that first generation that the stories that warm the hearts of the second generation that caused them to follow God, the third generation is just so even further separated from that that they really don't care. That it just doesn't make sense to them. It's just not relevant to them. They can't relate to what their grandparents experienced. And so my grandmother's here today, and her, uh, my late grandfather had a profound experience in my life. I really think the reason why I'm here is because of their influence in a lot of ways. But, but when she tells me these stories of the good old days, as she calls them, right, I just can't relate a lot of times. And she can't relate to a lot of things that I go through, a lot of things that I'm passionate about. So, Grandma, do you know who Chewbacca is? <laughs> no, she doesn't have a clue who Chewbacca is. She just can't relate. Generation gap right here. Those good old days of Joshua just aren't relevant to this third generation of believers. And so this is what's happened in our country, isn't it? That America has become a people that are made up of this third generation of faith. People who don't really care about God, and they definitely don't care about anything that God's ever done for you. So you can tell them and tell them and tell them, and a lot of times they just don't listen. They're so separated. A lot of times that happens in families. And we see this every single day. Because for a lot of us, that hits home. Because it might be your friends that are like that. It might be your children, your grandchildren. The fact is we all know people that are very dear to us that are in this third generation of faith. That they just don't care about the Lord. That's why you never see in the Bible that God has grandchildren. Because God doesn't have grandchildren. He never wants us to be that separated from him. God only has children. He wants us to experience him firsthand. He wants everything that we go through to be relevant to us. Let me explain it to you this way. The scriptures say that God is an all-consuming fire. And so for this first generation of believers, they experience the fire firsthand. And it changed them completely. It's all gooey and nasty and it stinks right now. You can't smell it. But it's changed When the fire touches something, when fire burns something, it's never the same again, is it? So if you're a chemist in here, a chemical engineer, I assume I've heard that everyone here works at Eastman, so <laughs> I'm uh, assuming that that would be you. If you came up here and tried to chemically make this straw right again, if you tried to chemically do something to it to make it back to normal, you would say that's impossible that the fire has completely changed it for good. Nothing can be done to make this go back again. That the fire, what it's done to it is permanent. It will never be the same. This is what happens to people that have this first generation of faith. God has touched them in such a way that they're never the same again. And what happens to the second generation of faith is that they are warmed by the fire, but they're not changed by the fire. They hear the stories, and it's heartwarming, and it sounds good, and, you know, God must be real because all these people went through so much, and, and God got them out of it. And so you give your life to Christ. You follow Christ. But there's something that's just a little bit different because you've been warned, but you haven't been touched by the fire. And then the third generation just gets so far away 
that it doesn't even matter. Who cares about what God's done? He hasn't helped me. Right? I've prayed and prayed and prayed, and this still, all this crap still happened in my life. So God's, God hasn't touched me by any means. They're not warmed at all by God's flame. And so let me ask you this question. Where do you find yourself? You find yourself in that first generation of faith where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is real, that God has worked in your life in such profound ways that for you and for your house, there's no question, it's crystal clear, you will worship God. Or are you in that second generation of faith? I think this is the majority of Christians, that they hear about what God's done in people's life. They're warmed by it. They say, gosh, God is, God must be real. But I mean, I can't really relate to that in a lot of ways. I'm not completely changed, but you still follow Christ. You still love him. You still come to church. You still do everything that you need to do to try to have a closer relationship, but just something hasn't happened. Or are you in the third generation of faith where it just doesn't matter? A lot of those people come to church because they come to church. They like going to a place where people are nice, where people are friendly. They get to hear, hopefully, an energizing sermon, something that inspires them, something that encourages them. And so they like coming to church, but they just secretly, you know, they're just, they don't believe, they don't have that faith at all. So where are you? Be honest with yourself. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. We're not Baptists here. (laughs) But internalize it. Ask yourself that hard question. So how do we move into that first generation? How do we help others move into that first generation of faith? Part of the task falls on the people that are in the first generation of faith. That first and foremost, you have to share your story. You have to share your story. You have to become vulnerable when it's not comfortable. You have to let people know what you've been through, where you've been, where the chains are in your life. You have to open some closets that you don't want to open. Because when you do that, it changes the world. Before long, whenever you do that, whenever you share your story, this third generation of believers, they, they start to hear things in a new way. Because when you share your story, you're sharing it with your family, you're sharing it with coworkers, you're sharing it with friends, you're sharing it with people that you really care about usually. And they hear that and they begin to be warmed a little bit because it's relevant to them when you're that close to them. When you work with somebody every single day and then you share with them how God has worked in your life in powerful ways, they hear it in a different light. It's different than hearing a preacher say it. It's different than hearing a street preacher say it. It's different than going to a conference and hearing somebody say it. But when it comes from you, it speaks loud. It speaks powerfully. Before long, that third generation then becomes second generation of believers and They begin to experience God in a new and powerful way, and they begin to realize that God is working in their life every day, and they just keep on this journey. And as they continue to walk down this journey, they just wake up one day, and they realize that God is there, that God is real, and that for them, it's no question. A few weeks ago, about a month ago, I guess now, I was in Africa, and uh, I spent some time in Kenya, and... Uh, half of the trip was in urban settings, half the trip was in the African bush on the Serengeti. And as it was just such a beautiful place, this is an acacia tree. And whenever you think of Africa, a lot of people think of these trees. They're just absolutely beautiful. And as you look out onto the African plain, you see these trees every once in a while. But as you look down from those trees onto the ground, you see these bushes. And they're small bushes, they're only about yay big, but they are absolutely everywhere. And you, there's places that you can't even walk without stepping onto these bushes. And these bushes are very bright green, they look very beautiful, a lot of them have what look like grapes on them. 
But also on them are these anywhere from two to three inch thorns. And we have a picture of that, these thorns. But they are everywhere. There are literally thousands and thousands of these thorns on each and every one of these bushes. And the ones that look like they have grapes on them, there's so many thorns that the thorns are poking right through the grapes. And as I've reflected on just those things, they really struck me as interesting because they were just absolutely everywhere. I started to realize that these bushes are happy. They're happy because no one messes with them, right? No animals would ever dare try to get that fruit. No humans would ever dare try to touch them because these thorns would just eat you up. They live in their own little world. Nothing challenges them. Nothing pushes them. Nothing wants them to change. No one can make them change. So they're happy. But at the same time that I realize that they're happy, that they're comfortable, I also realize that they're completely useless, that they aren't serving anyone in any way. See, friends, when God touches your life, when he changes your heart of stone to a heart of flesh, when something happens that you just know life's never going to be the same, When that happens, you have a story to tell. You have such a story to tell. And when you don't tell your story, when you have one and you don't tell it, you don't share it, you become just like those bushes, completely useless. Friends, God has done too much. He has done too much for us to become useless bushes. As Lucas comes up and the rest of the band, I just want to ask you a question. And it's a question that if you ask yourself this every single day, and if you really try to answer it every single day, you'll start to feel yourself moving into that first generation of faith. It's a question that if you ask your children, kids as young as two or three can really begin to wrestle with this question and answer it. But if you ask your kids this question, you're going to raise them to be first generation believers. And there's nothing greater as a parent that you could ever do except bring your children up in the faith. And that question is simply this. Where have you seen God at work in your life today? See, when you start to ask yourself that question today, where has God seen, where has God been at work? And you really start to try to answer it, you realize that God's really at work everywhere. That he constantly has his hand on you. That he is constantly pushing you in new and better directions. That God is always at work. Where have you seen God at work in your life today? The second verse of the song that we're getting ready to sing is just such a powerful verse. It says, you're rich in love. You're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing 10,000 reasons for my heart to find. That literally, when you ask yourself that question and you really begin to start to answer it, you realize that God's at work in so many ways. You begin to realize that God is constantly loving you. You begin to realize that God is working in your family, that God is bringing people into your life so that you can share your story. God has blessed us beyond measure. And when you share that with others, you truly begin to change the world. You begin to make a difference for the kingdom of God. You begin to bring his kingdom here. Let's pray.
Father, we are so humbled by the great works that you have done in our midst. We are so blessed by how you work in our life every single day. And so, Father, help us to recognize it. Help us to realize just how much you really do love us. Help us to begin to count the reasons because, Father, we'll never be able to stop. 10,000 still just a small number compared to the blessings that you have given us in our life. So, Father, help us to be encouraged this morning. Help us to leave here on a mission. Help us to realize that we can change lives together, that you have sent people in our lives so that we can just simply share our story with them. Coworkers, family members, our friends, all these connections that we have are for a purpose. And so, Father... Give us courage. Give us wisdom. And help us bring your kingdom on earth. And it's in Christ's name that we do ask all of these things.